It's a seance table. Like Ouija board seance? A bit more serious than that. Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about one of the episodes from Cabinet of Curiosities, a horror anthology series on Netflix from Guillermo del Toro. Every episode is a different story and has a different director. We're going to be looking at the first episode, Lot 36. It's an original story by Guillermo del Toro and was directed by Guillermo Navarro. Navarro was the cinematographer for other fan-favorite del Toro films such as Pan's Labyrinth, Kronos, and Pacific Rim. Lot 36 stars Tim Blake Nelson as Nick Appleton. Each story begins with an intro and we're shown an item from the cabinet, and this time, it's a set of keys. Before we find out what these keys lead to, I have a question. Would you guys like to gain access to more movies, protect your online data, and find better deals when shopping? Then today's sponsor, Atlas VPN, can help. I think having a VPN is really important these days to protect yourself from people stealing your data and spying on you. Want to watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Mad Max Fury Road, or Shawshank Redemption on Netflix? Then just switch your location to Canada, and there you go. By changing your location using their different servers, you can also get better deals on flights, subscription services, and more. Atlas VPN can be used on unlimited devices and can really help you make the most of all the services you already pay for. Plus, they're having a Black Friday sale right now. Atlas VPN is the best deal on the market for only $1.70 per month and you get 6 months free when you get a 3 year plan using my link in the description below. So if you've been thinking about trying a VPN, now is the time. Click the link in the description to scoop up their awesome Black Friday deal. And thanks so much to Atlas VPN for sponsoring the video, I really appreciate it. The episode begins with us seeing an elderly man who eats a lot of TV dinners. He puts on an apron and begins butchering small animals in the kitchen. I think they're rabbits. A head accidentally drops on the floor and as he bends over to pick it up, he has a heart attack and passes away. This is the owner of the mysterious Lot 36. Only that we will prevail, but that out of the horror of... Next we are introduced to the main character, Nick Appleton. We eventually find out that he fought in the war and returned home poor, deaf in one ear, and his wife left him. This has made him extremely bitter. Now, to make ends meet, he got into the storage locker business, and he needs to hit it big soon because he owes money to some bad people. Nick goes to the auction and finds the first one for sale is Lot 36. The manager, Eddie, says that the locker was owned by the same guy for decades. They open it up so everyone can have a look inside, but only for a second. It seems to be full of typical stuff like furniture. Nick goes ahead and bids on lot 36 and wins it for $400. Sold to the shy man with the deep pockets. After the auction, Nick uses the phone to call someone and we get the impression that he owes money to some bad people and they want it now, but he tells them that he needs more time. We also find out that Nick and the manager Eddie are friends, or at least they work together. Eddie tips Nick off about the good locker so that he will know which ones to bid on, and in return, Eddie gets compensated. Nick pays Eddie for lot 36 and his cut from the last locker. Nick says, okay, give me the keys, but Eddie says, before we get to that, I want to show you something. He puts in a VHS tape and plays it. It shows the old man from the beginning. Eddie explains that he's had the lot since 1945, and every day for decades, the man would come to the locker carrying the same bag, stay for an hour or so, and then leave. Eddie seems to be intrigued. Nick, on the other hand, doesn't seem to care at all, assuming the old man was just crazy. But then it gets even weirder. As the man approaches the door to the locker, he then steps back and hops forward like a rabbit three times up to the door. Even Nick is a little confused by this behavior. Well, here's the hopping again. What do you think it is? <laughs> Eddie says there must be something good in there for him to come back and check on it like that. But Nick isn't so sure because he's seen some pretty gross and weird stuff in storage lockers. The old man also does the same ritual with the hopping when he leaves the locker. Every day for decades, this man would arrive with a full bag, perform his strange ritual and enter the locker. Then an hour or so later, he would exit the locker with the bag now empty. Nick says, yeah, obviously it's a storage locker, but Eddie knows it's too weird. Since we seen the elderly man butchering a number of small animals, I think we can assume that that's what's in the bag. He wasn't eating the animals because we can see what he eats. So that leaves the question, what could he possibly be doing with dead animals in the storage locker? 
for your lot 36. Enjoy. Eddie has to deal with a customer, Miss Amelia, who has come to pay her locker fees, but Eddie informs her that they sold it on the block when they didn't hear back from her. Come to find out it was actually Eddie's fault because Miss Amelia gave him the new address to send the bill to and he forgot. And guess who he sold it to? Nick, of course. She tries to plead with Nick to let her get some of her family photos and important items, but he doesn't want to hear it and tells her too bad. He gives her a lock and says maybe you can use this. Hopefully karma doesn't come back to bite him for that. This is yours. I bet you can still use it. Nick finally goes to the locker to see what's inside. Old furniture, lamps, and boxes of junk. While inside, Nick has to keep turning the lights back on because they're on a timer. Pretty smart, I guess, to save electricity, and I'm sure that won't come into play later. After taking a brief look around, Nick hears Eddie working on the pipes in a room close by. Nick says, the unit I got is a lot smaller than this. Eddie says, nothing's up to code in this section. It was built in the 1940s. Units were wider, deeper, steeper, connected to each other. Hmm. The two get into a bit of an argument over Miss Amelia's locker. Eddie says, come on man, just let her see if any of her stuff is still in there. But Nick says, the game has rules. You win some, you lose some. Look at me. I did what I had to for this country. The game I played was rigged. Lost this ear except for high-pitched ringing day in and day out. Fine. Wife gone? Fine. I'll take the losses, but now it's my turn. Eddie says, why do you have to bring that into everything? Giving us the impression that Nick brings this up quite often and it bothers him a lot. So basically, because Nick feels like he's been done wrong, now it's his turn to make other people as miserable as him. It's surprising how much of a bad person Nick is, but I do still kind of feel bad for him. You can tell that Eddie has grown used to Nick, and the two go back and forth like this quite often. Nick begins cleaning out the locker, taking some things to his truck and others to the garbage. The first strange thing that Nick finds in the locker is a case with a few items inside. A gold candelabra and a photo album. In the album is pictures of a woman and a little girl. Under the little girl, someone wrote Dottie and under the woman wrote mom. So this must be the sister and mother of the old man from the beginning. As Nick looks at these photos, we can hear faint ghostly whispers. The photos quickly take a turn for the worse, Nazi soldiers. Nick closes the book and puts it down, but puts the candelabra in his bag. He makes his way to the back of the storage unit and finds some kind of strange decoration that looks like some kind of necklace or wreath. He puts it aside and pulls a sheet off some chairs as he does, the strange whispering begins again. Nick seems to pay no attention or make no mention of the whispers, so I assume that he cannot hear it, or is ignoring it. There's two chairs with strange carvings on them and a table with a pentagram. He brings the table and chairs out of the unit because they look like they might be worth something. As Nick is getting in his truck to leave, someone smashes the window and assaults him. Before leaving, the man says, 12K, tomorrow. This man was sent by whoever Nick owes money to, and apparently Nick now has to come up with the $12,000 by tomorrow. Miss Amelia sees all this go down and Nick angrily tells her to shoo. Eddie finds Nick patching himself up in the office. Nick says he's gonna go get some stuff appraised, but Eddie tells him to take his stuff to Agatha's place this time instead of where he usually goes and gives him her number. Nick duct tapes his windshield and heads over to Agatha's. She seems to be some kind of antique collector. She's disappointed in the gold candelabra, saying she'll only pay scrap for it. But the table and chairs she's interested in. It's a seance table. Nick says, like, Ouija seance? And she says, a bit more serious than that. While running her hands across the table, she quickly finds an area that can be pressed down. When pushed down, the sides of the table suddenly pop out, revealing secret drawers. Inside are three books. Liber Primus Daemonia, Liber Secunda Symvolia, and Liber Tertius Paralipsi. These books are in Latin. Liber Primus Daemonia means the first book of demons. The second book, Liber Secunda Symvolia, translates to second book of symbols. And the third book, Liber Tertius Paralipsi, from what I could find, translates to book three of life. But that might not be a perfect translation because I'm no Latin expert. 
So if you know exactly what it means, please leave it down in the comments. Liber primus daimonia. Nick asks, do you know what they are? Probably important, I bet. But Agatha says, not my province. But she tells him she knows someone that might be interested. Lastly, Nick pulls out the strange white flower thing. Nick comments that he's never seen one before. But Agatha says, oh, I have. Many times. She tells him to gently feel it. It's human hair. And I would guess that this hair probably came from the old man's sister. And you'll probably agree once you learn more. Weaving or braiding hair into jewelry was a practice that started around the 17th century and was made popular in the Victorian era. Hair could be braided to jewelry or used to create a wreath like this one. Hair can be looped to create designs that look like flowers or even ground up to make pigment. These pieces are usually made for someone who is mourning. The body rots away, but hair can last decades, even centuries. Human hair, smell. Yeah, no thanks. Agatha calls her friend Roland to come take a look at the mysterious books. While on the phone, Nick opens one up and flips through the pages. We see images of small demons feeding on a human, what looks like a human being enslaved by a demon, and on the other page is a demon on one side and a skeleton on the other, holding up a child draining their blood into an urn on a goat's head. There's a man in the corner holding another child behind his back and it looks like he's trying to stop whatever is happening. I'm not sure exactly what this stuff means, but the book is super interesting. I have a client here with some very interesting items. Right up your alley, you know what I mean? Soon after Agatha's friend Roland arrives, he first looks at the table and says it's 19th century Austria, white cedar and sandalwood, treated in a very unique way and arranged to facilitate the summoning of an entity. Roland then points out to Nick the reddish tint in the lacquer on the table and says guess what went into it. I'm not sure if he means that blood was added to the lacquer when the table was made, or sacrifices done on the table have caused blood to seep into it. But I think the blood was put into the lacquer when the table was made. Nick then pulls out the three books, and Roland is shocked. The first question he asks is was there a fourth book? Nick says no, but there's still a locker full of stuff. Roland explains that the books are very rare. He's willing to pay $10,000 for the three of them, but if they can find the fourth volume, he will pay Nick $300,000 for the complete set. The fourth book is the rarest, Liber Quartus Sacramentum, which means book four, sacrifice. Roland says it's legendary, full of symbols and spells to bind a demon, make it earthbound. The reason the fourth volume is the rarest is because it burns completely at the end of the transaction, along with the purveyor of its favors, except when the demon has been betrayed, therefore unable to collect its debt. Nick says if he wants the books, this deal has to go down tonight, because as we know, Nick has to have the $12,000 by tomorrow. Roland pays $10,000 for everything and donates the weird hair wreath to Agatha. Nick and Roland then head over to the storage unit in his truck. Do you mind closing uh, the side window, please? While driving, Roland gives Nick some more information about the previous owner of Lot 36. Roland says, I have a confession to make. I know all about the family who owned the unit that you bought. They were very rich, made their money from steel in Europe, and immigrated to America at the end of World War II. They made weapons, Wolfram tanks, but for the wrong side. Nick says, yeah, I've seen some old war photos in there. This man knew and did evil on a scale almost absolute. Nick says, well, God's got him now. To this, Rowan chuckles and dismissively says, God, the silent strong type that loves to see us squirm with free will and other delusions. But what about his adversary, huh? Relentless, feisty even, you know, whispering in our ears at every waking moment. Nick says, something tells me you traffic in the wrong feisty side yourself there, Hans. Roland asks, does that matter for this transaction? He explains the owner of the unit was a sick man who gambled his fortune away and destroyed his family, which explains why we see him living the way that he was. He moved in occult circles in Berlin and Vienna, and he invoked an entity, offered it a vessel to occupy, to possess, his sister, Dottie Walmart. Nick asks if they ever found the sister, but Roland says no. 
it was futile. During the reign of Nazi Germany in World War II, there was many occult groups and many theories debating whether the origin of Nazi beliefs were based on occult religions. There's a popular book on this called The Occult Roots of Nazism by Nicholas Goodrich Clark. Apparently one of these groups still exists today, called the Order of Nine Angels that stems all the way back to World War II. Many films, comics, and games have depicted these theories like the Nazis and Raiders of the Lost Ark, Hellboy, or even Call of Duty. Between 1936 and 1941, Heinrich Himmler and some high-ranking Nazis would travel to a castle in northwestern Germany once a year to take part in satanic rituals and read cultish writings. These leaders and SS officers would also dress up in knight's gear at a round table and try to channel the pagan heroes of German legend. Long story short, Nazism and the occult go together like peanut butter and jam. And he invoked an entity, offered it a vessel to occupy. After hearing Roland's story, the two arrive at the storage facility. Nick says, I'm not interested in any of this creep show stuff you favor, okay? Which I think is a little nod to the similarities that this show shares with Creepshow. It also tells us that Nick still doesn't believe anything that Roland is saying. While the two are walking to the unit, Roland pulls out the candelabra. Nick says, are you kidding me? Put that thing away. Roland tells him that the molten metal that makes up the candelabra was collected from a very particular source. And if they find the book, the light from it will protect them. Nick is a bit of a skeptic to say the least. The light from the candelabra will yield protection. No offense, but shut the f up. Candles have long been used in different religions. They're often used in prayer or to keep away dark spirits. During the witch hunt in the Middle Ages, inquisitors' handbooks like the Malleus Maleficarum said that holy candles were consecrated objects and would protect you from witches. Farmers also used holy candles for protecting livestock from danger and bewitchment. As for the metal the candelabra is made out of, I think it's made out of melted down holy objects, possibly very important ones, similar to the bullets that Constantine uses. The two begin searching for the fourth book, and Roland finds a bunch of newspapers talking about the missing sister. Where are you, Dottie Volma? My theory is that he's looking for the fourth book because if the fourth book is not burned, then the demon is still bound to the earth. So I think what he's really searching for is the entity summoned by Mr. Walnar. Roland is also obviously German and has admitted to dealing in the other side. Maybe he was a part of those occult circles in Berlin and Vienna as well. Maybe he was jealous of the power that Mr. Walnar was able to gather for himself using the powers of the entity. While looking around, Roland discovers that there is a false wall at the back of the unit. Nick comments that he knew the measurements for this unit were off, which he brought up to Eddie earlier. The two move some stuff out of the way and discover a door. Nick thinks for sure the book must be hiding back there, and Roland must know something we don't, because he instantly grabs the candelabra and inserts the candles. As soon as the door is open, Nick is disgusted by a strong smell. Roland says in my field, we call it a fluvia, like when a cat or dog marked their territory. It's very common in demonology for demonic manifestations to cause a rotting or sulfur smell. Roland stops Nick before he enters and becomes very serious. He tells Nick, do not touch anything. Do not say anything. If anything not from the natural world is found on the other side of this threshold, I have one piece of advice for you. Do not make eye contact with it. Do not speak with it. It will sense the dark in you, as I do. It will be greedy for it hungry for it. They begin walking down a long curvy corridor with book pages and crucifixes along the walls. Roland looks at one of the crucifixes with reverence, like he's careful not to disturb them. Upon reaching the end of the hallway, they are greeted by a horrifying sight. Never in my imagination, he trapped his poor sister. At the end of the corridor is a small room. In the middle is Dottie Walnar, the old man's sister, pinned to the floor inside a demonic summoning circle. And beside her on a pedestal is the fourth book. Roland is taken aback, but he's not that surprised considering what he's seeing. Roland says the demon is weak, must be starving. Poor thing. 
It's probably starving because the owner hasn't been here to feed it rabbits, or possibly it's starving because it's trapped in the circle. The body has been pinned in the circle so long, the hair has fused to the floor. The demon took her face as a way to get in and hides within her. All we can see is some tentacle-like appendages stretching up into the head. You got the demon to hide. See, it took her face as a way in. While Roland is taking in the sight of the demon, Nick is focused on one thing, the book and his money. Roland tells him not to cross that line, but Nick doesn't believe in any of this crap and walks over to grab the book. And when he does, he drags his foot over the circle, breaking it and awakening the demon. Instantly, the candelabra erupts in large flames and Roland says, you have no idea what you've done. Nick goes over to the book and it's open to a page with a pentagram with a circle around it most likely the same one that we see on the floor. The demon begins to awaken, taking over Dottie's body and becoming a mass of writhing tentacles on a set of legs. When I see the demon, I can't help but think of H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu. As the creature stands, Roland seems to be in awe, and before he can snap out of it, the creature grabs him and devours him. When this happens, the book that Nick is holding erupts in flames, signaling that the transaction has been complete. Mother of God. Nick runs out of the secret area and out of Unit 36. He tries to exit the building, but the door is locked. But wait, there's someone outside. It's Miss Amelia. Karma really is the worst. She coldly puts the lock that Nick gave her on the door. He screams and pounds on the door, but it's no use. He turns around, and as soon as he tries to run, the demon grabs him. If the demon truly feeds on darkness, like Roland said, then Roland and Nick were probably quite a meal. I wonder what Roland would have done with the demon. Mr. Walmar used the powers of the demon to become an extremely wealthy weapons dealer during World War II and was part of occult groups in Berlin and Vienna. He would probably host rituals and perform favors for others using the power of the demon. Since Mr. Walmar was the one who summoned the demon and made the deal, it's possible only he could control it. Or, only he understood how to use the book. He must have somehow transported the demon all the way from Europe to America when he moved there. I'm still not sure why he did the hopping before entering and leaving the locker though. It's never explained. My best guess is that it's part of some kind of ritual to provide him with more protection against the demon. My other question is why was he feeding it rabbits every day for decades? Was that part of the deal that he made? To make a certain number of sacrifices each day? Roland says that Mr. Walmar grew greedy, going to the demon more and more often for favors. So was he feeding the demon every day to keep it alive? Or was he asking it for something every day? And if so, what? We heard that he lost his family and his fortune. So what could he still be using the demon for? It looks like animal sacrifices must be used because when the demon consumes a human soul, it ends the transaction. Earlier, Roland said that when the transaction is complete, the fourth book, along with the purveyor of favors, will burn up. But I'm still not sure who he means by the purveyor. My best guess is the purveyor is the human, in this case, Mr. Walmar, because when the book burns, the demon is still fine. And because the book burned after it ate Roland, the deal must have been for one human soul. There was a few little inconsistencies and some things were never explained like the hopping, but overall, I liked this episode. They tried to pack a lot into an hour and they did a pretty good job. Most of the episode is spent on getting to know Nick and the mystery of the locker slowly building. The demon only appears in the last few minutes but I enjoyed everything that led up to what they find in Lot 36. Nick was a miserable, greedy guy. If he would have just helped Miss Amelia earlier, she would have opened the door for him and he would have lived. But even before that, his greed is probably what led him to borrow more money than he could pay back and then to ignore Roland and cross the circle to get the book. I would say my only big nitpick with this episode is Miss Amelia. Her character is fine, but she feels tacked on to the story. Nick bought a locker at another auction and it turned out to be hers, and he refuses to give her personal stuff back, so they get into a disagreement. 
but then later she's seen outside the building at night watching Nick. Why? What was their plan? To just lock him in the building? I felt like she was shoehorned in just to appear later to seal Nick's fate, but I think the episode would have felt less convoluted without her. I've seen a lot of people being confused about what she had to do with the story. Some people thought she was trying to claim Lot 36, but that wasn't the case. She was talking about a totally separate locker. If it was a full-length movie, a lot of these mysteries could have been better flushed out. But that's kind of why I like anthology series. They leave a lot to the imagination. That's my video on the first episode from Cabinet of Curiosities. I've been a big fan of Del Toro's work for a long time. He's worked on many of my favorite shows and movies like Blade 2, The Strain, Hellboy, Pan's Labyrinth, and more. I might eventually look at another episode from this series because there was one other one that I really enjoyed. If you haven't checked out this series on Netflix and you're a big fan of horror, I definitely recommend it. If there's any movies or TV shows you think I should cover, please leave them in the comments below. I always enjoy reading through them. I'm currently working on a video that's been highly requested, but I don't want to give it away. If you enjoyed, leave a like. And if you haven't, hit that subscribe button. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.